Welcome to all of you to this uh, ethics colloquium. Um, wonderful to see you. In particular, I would like to, uh, to welcome my colleague Ingela Tietze from the Hochschule Pforzheim. We are together in the Clearac Graduate School and I was a bit surprised to see you here. Welcome. Uh, but most welcome, of course, is Eike Düvel, who is the today's uh, representator. Eike Düvel is postdoc at the Filetas Group in ITAS, uh, led by Rafaela Hillerbrand. His fields of experience and competence are energy ethics and the ethics of risk. He holds a BA in philosophy and economics from the University of Bayreuth in Germany, Bavaria, uh, an M MA in philosophy from the University of Göttingen, also Germany, but um, what is this, Lower Saxony, um, and a PhD um, from the doctoral program, PhD in philosophy from the doctoral program, Climate Change at the University of Graz in Austria, uh, a program which is very famous in the area of climate ethics. It was initiated and coordinated by um, Lukas Meyer. I guess most of you will know him or his name um, because he's famous in the area of climate ethics. Uh, now, what's the topic today? Um, energy transformation. Many of us are dealing with energy transformation at different uh, on different aspects and, and issues. Um, the, the way for today, the today's talk in my memory is the year 2011. In that year, the German strategy on the energy transformation was yeah, renewed after the Fukushima disaster. Um, the Energiewende as a, as a famous notion was born. And I remember very well, there was huge optimism in that year and perhaps also the year after. Um, that German engineers will make it, managers, researchers, and so on, and that we will have a great energy future with only win-win situations. This optimism disappeared quickly, as I guess all of you know, and uh, since now about almost 10 years, we have a lot of discussions about uh, energy poverty, for example, and other problems with losers. Yeah, the energy transformation not only has winners as a consequence, but, but winners as well as losers, in parentheses, as any transformation has. So it is quite normal that there are winners and losers as well. And as soon as we have winners and losers, the question for the distribution of gains and, and losses um, comes into the game and the issues of ethics and justice, justice uh, of course, and this leads directly to your talk, Eike. You will deal with the compensation of losers with, with arguments in this field. And yeah, I'm keen to learn from you about your ideas on this field. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kuhnwald, for the warm introduction and um, yeah, first, maybe also uh, thank you to Giovanni, of course, for setting all of this up and for organizing the energy ethics lecture. Um, and also the Philetas group in general, who have also done a lot of work to make this possible. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to start my presentation in just about a moment. Um, yeah, um, again, thank you for having me here and also thank you for the introduction and uh, a lot was already said in the introduction, but I want to use um, this title slide to um, to introduce the topic a bit more. So uh, the topic today is stranded assets and legitimate expectations. Um, and the question and the subtitle here is compensating the losers of the energy systems transformation. And you can already see that I changed the order between the title and the subtitle. Uh, since um, the longer I work on this topic, uh, the more the importance of especially legitimate expectations becomes clear to me. And this is something um, where I really want to go into depth today, understanding the concept of legitimate expectation, uh, its significance, and its importance. Um, so in order to do that, um, I um, will follow the following structure. 
Um, so I will talk first a bit about the energy systems transition and legitimate expectations, trying to explain and to locate the, con uh, the concept in general. Um, I will then develop an account of legitimate expectations um, in more detail. And there are two questions that I'm especially interested in and that I think are especially relevant in the context of the energy systems transition. And these uh, questions concern the question of or concern redress or compensation for frustrated expectations and the question of how to weigh legitimate expectations against other normative claims. And in the end, I will cover um, two uh, objections, time permitting. Good. Um, so let me go to the first slide. So um, as you can see from the title, um, part of this or what grounds uh, this whole discussion is the issue of stranded assets and especially stranded assets in energy systems. So it's maybe worthwhile to talk a bit about what stranded assets are. So um, stranded assets are all the things that during the energy trans uh, energy systems transitions or in the course of the energy systems transition become economically unviable. So that means someone invested money in something, built something, bought something, uh, something uh, and because of changes in the legal and regulatory framework, um, these investments become stranded, so economically unviable. And that concerns a whole bunch of, um, yeah, of assets that become economically unviable during the energy systems transition. For example, all the things for surveying and extract, uh, extracting fossil fuels, right? Like all the uh, research that has gone into finding where fossil fuels are and how many and how they can be extracted. Uh, things like oil rigs, um, excavators, and so on and so on. But this goes further down um, and also goes to distribution and refining of fossil fuels, right? Um, so uh, gas stations, pipelines, uh, um, machinery to move coal around, for example, and so on. And then finally, of course, um, all the things um, that uh, where fossil fuels are used. So the use in transportation, heating and production. Um, so if we, uh, if we are serious with the energy systems transformation, and maybe I mentioned, I didn't mention this before because it should be relatively clear, the transition from one state to the other. And here the one state is a fossil fuel based economy and the other state is um, an energy system that is based on renewables or an economy that is based on uh, renewable sources of energy. So this will create stranded assets in the process. Um, since I haven't defined that in detail yet, um, we should talk a bit about legitimate expectations and energy. So what do I mean by legitimate expectations? So um, a lot of things that uh, all of us do in life or hope for the future or plan for the future is connected to energy, right? So here are some examples as a graphic. Um, so this concerns uh, decisions such as what occupation to take up, where and how to live. Do I live in a single family home or in a city in a multi-party apartment? Uh, choices concerning mobility, but also choices concerning education, for example, um, the careers we choose, the knowledge that we acquire. And also concerns um, uh, our free time activities, of course, like uh, the uh, other projects in life that we pursue uh, that are connected to energy. So in, in this slide, uh, for example, the little airplane there might, uh, might signify that but also to some extent it might affect uh, choices of family planning and so on. Um, so legitimate expectations now, and this is an important distinction, um, are not the expectations that one can do these things, not in the first place, or those are not the expectations that I'm interested in, but legitimate expectations as I understand them here are legitimate are expectations about the stability of the legal and regulatory framework. So there's a legal and regulatory framework. This framework 
uh, sets the boundary conditions for how we uh, plan and execute our long-term projects and life plans. And if the legal and regulatory framework changes, our life plans and long-term projects might be affected. And this, it is these particular expectations uh, that I want to talk here about. There are more, of course, but um, this is uh, that's a broader discussion. Okay, so the energy system uh, changes or our energy systems change and these um, um, long-term projects and life plans are potentially at risk. So this is what uh, Armin Grunwald, uh, Grunwald mentioned earlier. Uh, there will not only be winners of the energy systems transformation, but there will also potentially be losers of the energy systems transition. And part of their normative claims uh, can be understood as being grounded in legitimate expectations, right? So when they claim that things are moving too fast or in the wrong direction, uh, one way to make sense of that might be um, that they formulated their life plans against a particular background and this background now changes, right? And it changes in a particular way because the state changes laws and regulations. This might be different if these changes were um, solely caused by, uh, for example, economic forces or um, um, by uh, new technologies and so on. That might also be the case, but I'm here interested in those changes that are caused by someone, namely the state, which raises the question of responsibility. Okay, I think someone has their microphone on. Uh, if I may ask everyone to check again. <laughs> That would be nice. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, so this is the one side of the energy systems transformation and its impacts. Here's the other side. And um, these are climate risks, extreme events, and related impacts of climate change. Um, so the energy systems transformation, of course, is not a goal in itself. We, we don't do it just for the sake of it, but we do it to avoid uh, dangerous anthropogenic climate change, right? So that's why we move away from fossil fuels to renewable sources. Uh, it's at least the main reason. There might be other reasons to change our energy systems, but this is certainly um, one of the main reasons. So what is at stake here are serious and widespread threats or direct violations of um, future people's human rights but also of the rights by now of currently living people, right? And if we put these two things together, um, we arrive at the question of climate justice and just transitions. So we have an, uh, an end goal here, or a goal, uh, which is uh, an energy system that protects people's basic human rights or people's rights more generally. Um, and in the process of that, we need to figure out how to undertake this transition in a just way, given that it might affect people's legitimate expectations and finally harm their long-term projects and life plans. Um, and in the process of that, I think two questions are especially salient. The one question concerns weighing. How do we weigh the importance of protecting people's legitimate expectations versus the importance of uh, future people's and currently people's human rights? Um, and what I want to do here is to develop an account of legitimate expectations that can give us at least some answers to that question, or at least uh, give us a way in which to think about these questions. The second question is how to react to um, frustrated legitimate expectations in those cases in which the state cannot minimize harm to them. Right? Of course, ideally, the state would just try to minimize harm to legitimate expectations, but where this is not possible, um, we may need to address uh, the harms or the risks of harm here. Good. Um, a special feature of uh, my account, or maybe not a special feature, but um, a further um, uh, a further condition of my or further characteristic of this account is that I'm mainly interested, or only interested, better to say, 
in the legitimate expectations of individuals. Uh, and in what follows, I will um, uh, I will talk about why I feel that or why I think uh, that um, legitimate expectations are important, right? So first, their significance derives from frustrated long-term plans in life uh, and life plans. I've already said that they are um, the object. Uh, the object of these expectations are laws and regulations. And there might be certain conditions for what makes expectations legitimate expectations. And um, here too, that we might think about, right? Like for an expectation to be a legitimate expectation, so not merely a prediction about the future, but a prediction worthy of protection. Um, that is about the future. There might be conditions such as epistemic validity, justice criterion, and so on. Um, more importantly about this slide or the next is what I don't want to talk about. Um, and I don't want to talk about uh, companies and legitimate expectations. Uh, um, as will become clearer later on, there's a number of good reasons for um, why uh, those seem to be, uh, why one wouldn't want to do that. But in a first uh, approximation, um, as far as I have understood, um, or as far as I uh, conceptualize legitimate expectations here, they require things that companies simply don't have, right? So companies don't have um, long-term projects and life plans of the sort that individuals have. Companies are not harmed uh, in the way that individuals are harmed by the frustration of their legitimate expectations. So uh, prima facie, it doesn't make much sense to talk about the legitimate expectations of companies. Why do I mention it though? So I mentioned this for two reasons. So when we uh, hear about stranded assets, um, we are talking mostly about the stranded assets or reading in the newspaper about the stranded assets of companies, right? Um, so this is where a lot of the debate is going. The stranded assets that fossil fuel companies potentially have on their balance sheets, uh, which uh, might lead to devaluations of, of their company valuation in the future. The question what to do about these, right? Uh, whether we should cause stranding intentionally to um, bring about the sustainable transformation um, or these kinds of things. And there have also been uh, legal cases in Germany and abroad uh, where companies claim that uh, their legitimate expectations have been frustrated and that they are thus due compensation. And one of the areas in which this uh, happens is international arbitration courts. So these are often uh, set up in conjunction with uh, international investment agreements where um, special tribunals are put in place where companies can sue countries uh, in circumstances in which countries uh, illegitimately changed the legal and regulatory framework in their country, leading to, um, to stranded assets or better to uh, frustrated investment in those countries, right? A company invests in a country in the expectation of doing business there, the country changes the laws, the investment is frustrated, and then the company can go to an arbitration tribunal um, that is not part of the country's legal structure and claim for compensation. And this has been done in the past already successfully, and it has specifically been done with reference to legitimate expectation. So um, uh, there's a debate about legitimate expectations when it comes to companies. Uh, and uh, it may very well be true that there's a concept of legitimate expectations uh, that covers what uh, that covers companies, and that there's one that covers um, covers individuals. And there might even be um, a concept that covers both of these um, concepts of legitimate expectations. But that is not what I'm interested in here. I think they are sufficiently different to take them apart, and for us to take about the legitimate expectations of individuals. And I think one needs to be careful when uh, discussing legitimate expectations to not um, somehow um, transpose the uh, significance of the frustration of legitimate expectations um, for individuals to the context of companies. Right? I think in the context of companies, a lot of this is driven uh, by considerations 
um, of uh, that have nothing to do with um, what individuals suffer when their expectations are frustrated. It's just the business losing money, so to say, which might, of course, have downstream effects, but that is a different debate. Okay, um, and let's um, start with my account of legitimate expectations um, and its features. So um, I think first it is important to um, understand a distinction that's made in the philosophical debate on legitimate expectations. And this is the distinction between Humean accounts of legitimate expectations and Rawlsian accounts of legitimate expectations. And I don't want to delve in um, too deeply into the philosophical intricacies here, but what is important is that there are different um, proposals for how to understand uh, the relationship between beliefs and entitlements and whether to do that at all. And I think this becomes more clearer once we put the uh, two next to each other. So on the Humean account of legitimate expectations, and this comes from Margaret Moore, who has worked on these issues and introduced the distinction in the debate, uh, I believe. Um, on the Humean account of legitimate expectations, um, legitimate expectations are beliefs. They are expectations, and expectations are beliefs about uh, the future. And uh, in, in this case, they are beliefs about uh, the stability of the legal and regulatory framework, right? So they are beliefs or expectations. And then what makes them legitimate expectations is the existence um, of, or not existence, is um, if some further criteria hold. Uh, and authors differ on what exactly these criteria are and how they are to be fleshed out. But we might say that, for example, legitimate expectations are those expectations that are epistemically valid and minimally just, right? So epistemically valid means um, if I have a belief about the future or an expectation of what the future is going to be like, uh, there are certain uh, criteria that I need to fulfill or that my expectation needs to fulfill uh, in order to be legitimate. For example, uh, what I believe to be the case in the future has to be compatible with the evidence that is available to me. Right? And I will problematize this later on. Um, some authors also further introduce justice conditions in their uh, accounts of legitimate expectations. And what they mean by this is, or why they do this is that there may be lots of expectations uh, that are epistemically valid, but where we still would not grant that the state has any duty to protect these expectations. So one might, for, for example, think about the case of slavery, right? Like someone um, owning uh, people uh, might believe uh, that they will be entitled to own them in the future as well. And this might be epistemically valid in the sense that there's, there's no evidence that the government will change these laws. Um, but we still would want to say that there need to be, needs to be some condition of justice to distinguish expectations of this sort from really legitimate expectations. Further, some authors have introduced or relied on uh, conditions of legitimate authority where they say that for the expectations to be legitimate, um, the relevant laws and regulations have to be made by a legitimate authority, right? Um, and some authors, or say some authors, at least in some accounts, this is even all there is to expectations being legitimate. Good. Yeah, on the other side, I know, <laughs> first, before I come to the other side, the important part here is if you have the expectation and if it fulfills the criteria, then your, um, then your expectation is legitimate. And that means that this has normative consequences, right? So for example, that you might be owed compensation when your legitimate expectation is frustrated by the state. So in this way, uh, a belief creates an entitlement or yields, yields is better, yields an entitlement to compensation, for example. On the Rawlsian account, things start differently. Um, so Rawls says, among other things, a legitimate expectation that in a well-ordered society, individuals acquire claims to a share of the social product by doing certain things. 
encouraged by the existing arrangements. Um, so and what is implicit here, and it's a bit hard to, to, um, to find a quote where all it's super explicit about what legitimate expectations are, but legitimate expectations, I think one can interpret roles as are entitlements that people have if they contributed to and upheld um, the, uh, the framework in, in place or the existing arrangements that are in place, right? So legitimate expectations are simply entitlement. And as a result of that, one might have the appropriate beliefs that one has these entitlements to, but the focus is uh, certainly on legitimate expectations as entitlements in and of themselves. Good, yeah. Um, the next slide. So before I talk about um, the stringency of legitimate expectations, maybe worth uh, talking about why it's bad to have one's expectations frustrated. Uh, the first point here is quite clear, um, and I mentioned it a lot of times already. Um, expectations are connected to long-term projects and life plans. And if the uh, expectations are frustrated, uh, in many cases, one will not be able to um, pursue these uh, long-term projects and life plans. Uh, and that's bad for people. Uh, and it might be especially bad for people because uh, these long-term projects and life plans might play um, an important role for how people understand themselves. Uh, yeah, and maybe here it's also good to uh, take a step back from the philosophical um, discussion of these things and think about uh, real life examples of frustrated expectations uh, and, and where this happened, right? So one might think about, for example, the situation that many people found themselves in after the collapse uh, of, um, of the Soviet Union, right? And the uh, deep going and very serious uh, transitions that happened in the countries of the former Soviet Union and uh, its satellite states, uh, where people often from, maybe not from one day to the next, but in the span of a month or very few years uh, lost their occupation, um, lost maybe also in conjunction with that a lot of their social circles, their outlook for the future, uh, had a lot of the uh, long-term plans frustrated that they were engaged in, lost these things. And I think if one talks to people who experience these thoughts of or, or this transition in particular, one can feel that the harm of the uh, frustrated expectation is not exhausted in losing out on money or resources, but uh, in losing out on, um, or in losing uh, one's way of life, so to say, um, and also a lot of what one um, constitutes oneself as a particular person. So I think that underlines the special significance of this. And, um, now with the energy systems transition, at least similar narratives are brought up that uh, what it means for people working in industries that are either directly fossil fuel based or further down the supply, uh, supply chain of fossil fuel based companies uh, is uh, a similar worry that um, uh, their jobs will be lost, uh, their um, their areas in which they live will, will be deserted and so on and so on. Um, further in that is the second point here. Um, since there's this connection between uh, life plans and legitimate expectations, uh, or more generally between autonomy and legitimate expectations, uh, one could also understand um, the protection as of legitimate expectations as a matter of respect for autonomy, um, and especially the legitimate expectations that concern the legal and regulatory framework, which sets the boundary conditions in which people live their autonomous lives, right? And if one takes this away, it's potentially very harmful for people. Um, yeah. And then finally, um, and I will come back to this later, having one's um, legitimate expectations frustrated is more than losing a bet. It means that one uh, that one has one's entitlements 
uh, infringed upon or one's claims infringed upon, right? It's not as if um, someone bets money in the stock market uh, and expects stock to rise in the future, but they don't rise, they fall. Um, and then there's no, no claim to, um, to compensation by anyone because uh, taking this risk was up to the individual and there was no promise of a guarantee of stability by the state. But where we face legitimate expectations, there's some sort of promise, I think, um, that the state makes vis-a-vis um, -vis the citizens that there will be stability to uh, formulate and execute um, yeah, uh, life plans and long-term projects. Good. Um, so for the next uh, couple of minutes, I want to talk about what I call the stringency of legitimate expectations. Um, and by that, I mean um, those features of particular um, um, long-term projects and life plans uh, that make it so that the state's um, obligation to protect them uh, varies, right? So it will become clearer in a moment, uh, but there are many different legitimate expectations. And depending on some, some features of the long-term projects and life plans, um, the extent to which the state owes protection of these uh, of the um, respective legitimate expectations may vary. And this is, of course, um, important for determining the weight of these expectations. So the first one concerns epistemic validity. And I've talked about this before, but um, it seems uh, certainly to be the case that um, depending on the degree to, to which uh, an expectation is epistemically valid, um, the duties of the state differ. Um, the first condition here on this slide is what is the status quo? So is the individual uh, even justified in believing that the particular part of the legal and regulatory framework is uh, the way she thinks it is. So this is a, a mere factual correctness condition, so to say, when, of course, needs to hold a true belief about the current state uh, of the legal and regulatory framework. It's a minimal condition for expectations to be valid. The next point concerns the past stability. And I do think that um, there's an argument to be made that the longer a law has been unchanged and in place, uh, the more individuals are justified in believing it to be stable in the future. And this becomes more interesting together with the third condition, which concerns the likelihood of change. Um, so the legal and regulatory systems, of course, not set into stone and uh, changes to the legal and regulatory system are precisely made uh, because either we learn something new or the conditions change such that we can make things more just by changing the legal and regulatory framework. And the energy systems transition might be, or is certainly a point in case where um, we change uh, incentives, laws, subsidies, and so on in ways um, that, uh, yeah, that are more just or create a more just outcome. Um, and um, what I mean here by the likelihood of change then is to what extent does the individual have reason to believe that the law will change? And I found, while researching this, I found one good example, um, at least, <laughs> and this concerns um, the United States uh, Foreign Development Aid. And um, the United States spends development aid on a variety of causes, and among them is a development aid in the form of assistance with contraception and sex education. Uh, and this is, I, I haven't checked uh, right now, but this is the case right now. The United States spent money on this. Uh, but they spent money on this because uh, the United States currently has a democratic uh, government. Um, before that, the United States didn't change, uh, didn't uh, spend money on on these uh, on these issues. And even more so, whenever the government or whenever there's a conservative government in place or a Republican government in place in the United States, um, development aid is not spent on these issues. 
whenever there's a democratic government in place, uh, the United States spends development aid, or spend development aid is probably not the right, uh, gives development aid, of course, uh, to other countries for these issues. Um, so if you now imagine that someone um, gets hired by an NGO that does um, is financed by United States development aid and does work in another country and works specifically on providing uh, sex education and contraception. Um, seems to me that their expectation to be able to continue doing this in the future uh, might be weaker than in other cases because they've seen in the past that whenever um, uh, the uh, um, whenever um, Republican government is in place, this money is cut or cannot be spent on this anymore. Right. Good. Yeah. So that's the first condition. Epistemic validity uh, hangs together with the second condition that I call reasonableness. I'm not quite happy with this right now because it overlaps to large degrees with um, epistemic validity. But here I would like to mention two points. And the first one is uh, the compatibility with justice in the sense that. Um, it might be the case that um, the, um, the individual is justified in believing the law not to change, but it would still not be reasonable for them uh, in the sense that the law in place is such that um, it is unjust. And then I think one might phrase this in terms of um, compatibility with, uh, sorry, in terms of reasonableness, that would not be reasonable to uh, not expect um, the law to change. Yeah, uh, and then there might be a further condition and that is compatibility with evidence. Now, again, one might ask, why isn't this under epistemic validity? Here again, um, I want to introduce maybe just the slight considerations and want to point to the fact that there are often cases uh, in which there is evidence that the law needs to change, um, but uh, the government does not change it, obviously, or apparently, uh, but then the reasonableness condition might still be harmed. Yeah, but there's another point later on in the talk where I will talk a bit more about these problems. Condition number three is responsibility for managing risk. I will keep this a uh, bit shorter or the, also in the interest of time. Um, so um, what I mean by responsibility for managing risk is that there are certain parts of life um, where we think uh, that the responsibility to bear the relevant risks lies with the individual. And there are other parts of life where we expect uh, the responsibility to lie with the state and especially the responsibility to bear the costs of legal and regulatory changes. So I mentioned this earlier already. Um, uh, for example, if I make business decisions or financial uh, decisions or investments, um, it is understood that these are subject to the forces of the free market uh, and whatever um, I expect there in the future is not covered by legitimate expectations, but merely expectations. And in other areas, uh, we see this responsibility lying with the state, right? Good. Fourth criterion for the stringency of legitimate expectations is avoidability. And um, by avoidability, I mean um, if uh, expectations, legitimate expectations are in danger of being frustrated, the duty of the state might be stronger or the duty to compensation of the state or redress of the state might be stronger or weaker depending on how easy it is for the affected individuals to change their long-term projects or modify their long-term projects and life plans. Um, and there are two, um, two um, yeah, two sides to this maybe, or to uh, yeah, two considerations. So the first one is um, how do we specify the relevant uh, long-term projects and life plans? Um, right. So for example, someone uh, decides to become uh, uh, a miner. So someone working in a mine, right? Uh, and they do this not only to gain money, but what also um, interests them about this particular line of work. 
is the strong uh, social connections among colleagues, um, maybe uh, the type of the physical work that they are doing. So let's say they work in mining engineering and they're really interested in the engineering questions that are connected to mining um, and so on and so on. So the question now is whether their life plan really is to be a miner or whether their life plan is to be someone who works in the engineering sector faced with problems of a particular sort and so on and so on. So maybe it's a bit more, more difficult in the mine place, but let's say someone, someone works in the aviation industry constructing planes, then we might very well ask, uh, couldn't they do what they are doing in a more abstract sense also if they were working, uh, constructing trains or designing trains, right? It seems that uh, the harm that they would suffer by being retrained from working in the aviation industry to being retrained in the, um, in the uh, train industry is not that bad. So I only sketch this here, but I think what's necessary there is um, to uh, deliver an account of what exactly is the relevant um, life plan or long-term projects? And this, of course, hangs together with the second point here, whether there are alternatives available. A uh, fifth feature for the uh, stringency is the centrality uh, of the relevant life uh, plans or long-term projects. And I've, um, uh, yeah, and I think uh, together with the last feature, um, makes sense why this is its own feature. So there might be uh, long-term projects um, that are very hard to change in the sense of uh, avoidability is not given. It's hard to avoid the expectation to be frustrated, but still they might not be very important or things considered because they are not, um, they are not connected in important ways to a person's self-understanding. So let's say part of my long-term project is uh, to travel the world, to get to know different places, right? I have a bucket list. I want to see the Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon. Uh, I don't know. I want to go to Australia and so on and so on. Um, if, air, uh, if airplane travel is heavily restricted, it might be the case that I simply cannot afford these things any longer, right? Uh, and it's hard for me to change that life plan uh, in, or, or to avoid the frustration of that life plan or switch it to somewhat similar life plans might be that that is something that's very specific. Still doing this is not very central to my own self-understanding of the kind of person that I want to be. So it seems like while avoidability is very low um, or it's very difficult, the centrality is also not given. Other projects though, might um, or other things might might be more central to one's self-understanding. So, for example, the loss of one's homeland, social ties, and cultural attachment is very central to to someone's self-understanding, uh, and in this case, also very hard to uh, to avoid, right? Or to um, yeah, to exchange with something else. Then finally. Um, at least for some long-term projects and life plans, uh, means and position play a role. And I want to keep this short. This just means that um, whether legitimate expectations are frustrated also depends in many cases on a person's wealth. Um, yeah, on a person's wealth, right? The vulnerability is higher, the less wealth they have. For example, very rich people might not be much affected at all by a carbon tax, for example, um, whereas poor people, um, will uh, experience harms uh, to their central life plans very soon. Uh, same goes for geographic locations, dep location depending on where you live, um, uh, the frustration of particular expectations might be more or less harmful for you. Okay, then finally coming to the question of redress and weighing. And I will start with, uh, questions of redress, so how to react to um, frustrated legitimate expectations. So I've already uh, talked about the stringency of legitimate expectations. So the higher the stringency, the more prima facie at least um, the state is liable to compensation. And now I want to talk about features and means. So there are some further features of 
life plans that determine the means that we can take to uh, minimize harm to people or yeah, to minimize harm to those affected. Uh, and these hang together. So the stringency and the features together determine the means, so to say. Um, I've already talked about fungibility, right? But in most cases in which um, life plans are fungible or replaceable with, or projects are repla uh, replaceable with other projects, uh, we should go for this, right? We should uh, aim to replace them. Um, some life plans might be irreplaceable. And in these cases, some of the means that I'm going to show you on the next slide will not be available. For example, uh, retraining or adaptation to similar uh, industries. Um, then uh, what I call here viability with intervention. Uh, long story, but I don't have that much time left, so I will keep it short here. So I do believe that um, some long-term projects and life plans can be kept up with government assistance, whereas others cannot. And one example would be, um, yeah, I just saw a show about um, Japanese ink making for calligraphy, right? Where people uh, invest a lot of time and a lot of manual methods or like, use manual methods to create ink for calligraphy. Um, the ink itself is, yeah, it's very expensive uh, because of that, but even though, um, because people need to work on this for days and it needs to dry and so on and so on. Um, but even though um, people are willing to pay quite a bit of money for this ink, uh, the industry wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be there if the state didn't subsidize it in some ways. Um, but this seems to be fine. So I think for the people involved in creating these products, it doesn't matter that much that they wouldn't be able to survive on the free market um, with what they are doing, because there's, for example, an artisanal aspect to what they are doing. Whereas I find it harder to believe that um, so someone who's a coal miner, for example, would think the same about uh, government subsidized coal mining, right? Where we might be at a point where this industry is not viable at all. Maybe we are already there uh, and we're just keeping it alive to keep people employed, but I don't think that this. Um, does as much for them and their self-understanding as in the case of the Japanese ink maker. Finally, um, the protection of some uh, legitimate expectations or the relevant um, long-term projects and life plans means that we need to allow injustices to continue simply. It's not only that we compensate uh, people for something that we believe is unjust from our perspective now, uh, but that we even allow them to continue with these uh, practices. And one example would be um, uh, chicken cages in the European Union. Huh? So um, based on animal welfare considerations, certain types of chicken cages have been outlawed in the European Union because it's bad for the animals, actually very terrible for the animals. Uh, but still, um, there are long grace periods for producers to continue using these cages even though it's unjust in, in, in one sense, right? And uh, yeah, sometimes this might be the implication. Uh, in between, I've already mentioned the means that uh, are then determined by the, uh, by the uh, former two categories. So of course, uh, in many cases, retraining and adaptation measures um, can be undertaken to allow people to continue with their long-term projects. In other cases, monetary compensation might be sufficient um, to, to do this. Uh, sometimes in my last example, grace periods or grandfathering might be the means that um, we need to choose to minimize harm. And in some cases, acknowledgement and apologies might be the means uh, that are necessary, either in addition to the others, or they might, may simply be the only ones that we have that we can actually do. Yeah. Okay, so the how to weigh part, I will um, I will keep short. I think Giovanni, uh, I will take maybe four or five more minutes at most, and then I'm through. Um, good. Uh, yeah, the question of how to weigh. So um, based on this account of legitimate expectations, we now know uh, something about the stringency and the relevant means that we need to take uh, to protect these expectations, and. Uh, 
so this is more of um more of summarizing what I already said before, the question of how to weigh based on this account of legitimate expectations is not that difficult anymore because we know something about the stringency of these ex expectations and their relevant means. And um, since I adopted a Rawlsian account earlier anyway, um, I think it would be uh, natural to understand uh, this weighing process as something that is done from behind the veil of ignorance and the relevant goods at stake here uh, people's basic rights that protect them against the uh, consequences of climate change. And on the other hand, um, the need for uh, stability in the legal and regulatory framework that allows people to formulate and execute long-term projects and life plans. And both of, both of these things are things that people have reason to want. Uh, and there's a judgment to be made in particular cases then also about how these things would be weighed by someone who um, decides these questions ex ante. Okay, good. Um, one consideration when it comes to uh, weighing these claims uh, and uh, the factor of time, and I will keep this really short. If someone of you is interested in this, we can uh, do this in the discussion. Um, so, um, it seems that many expectations that have to do with being able to continue to emit greenhouse gases as, at current levels might not be legitimate uh, because uh, the science is there, it's been there for a long time, um, and people could have expected that um, the legal and regulatory framework would change. So at least for some uh, potential particularly egregious cases of uh, using lots of uh, carbon emissions or emitting lots of uh, CO2, uh, we could say that the relevant expectations are not legitimate. On the other hand, and I only mentioned that here, uh, we have really known this for a long time. And what people um, have also seen is that the government doesn't seem to be willing to change or to react uh, to these scientific findings uh, and change the energy, energy system in a way that would be um, appropriate to react to these findings. Uh, and I think there's a difficult discussion to be had to what extent um, people are required to act as if the government would do something and uh, the appropriate speed versus um, an interest of people not to be the suckers in the sustainable transformation or the first movers who uh, already um, um, uh, formulate different life plans and long-term projects that are compatible with what a just solution would require or just energy system would require. But this energy system never comes and they are paying the bill for all those uh, who correctly um, interpret the government as continuing to move too slow. But two objections and these only uh, very, very briefly, um, this is more personal interest that I want to uh, address in the, in the um, paper that this talk is based on. Two objections have recently been proposed, uh, among others, by Fergus Green. First, uh, when, uh, the first objection is the cost, the so-called cost of discovery objection. Not sure whether Green calls it like that, but the objection basically goes as follows. Legitimate expectations are expectations. To experience the harm of frustrated legitimate expectations, one needs to have legitimate expectations, right? One can only be harmed if one had the expectation. If one does not actually have legitimate expectations or expectations, one cannot actually experience harm from frustrated legitimate expectations. So what needs to be done is to determine who is harmed, the state needs to determine who actually has or had the relevant expectations. And this could be costly and intrusive. Uh, and just to, um, without going into too much detail here, if we understand legitimate expectations as entitlements, um, so the Rawlsian account of legitimate expectations and not the Humean one, um, I think this uh, cost of discovery objection doesn't apply because we are not starting from legitimate uh, from expectations and then determine whether they are legitimate, but we understand legitimate expectations as entitlements that people behind the veil of ignorance would have yeah, in the first place. So these are the expectations or legitimate expectations uh, of 
in, in a hypothetical situation. Second objection, and then I'm done. Um, so a particular um, family of legitimate expectations theories um, locates, I'm just going to read the quote here and then explain it. So Fergus Green says, uh, because the legitimacy basis is located in some macrostructural feature of the state that makes the law, in this instance, the legitimacy of the state authority, the verdicts it yields about the legitimacy of expectations are verdicts that apply generally to all agents adversely affected by a given legal change who share the expectation of legal stability. To make it very short, the idea here is there's a particular formulation of legitimate expectations theories that says um, legitimate expect or expectations are legitimate if the authority that made the laws and regulations is uh, legitimate. And this then yields, of course, that um, a whole bunch of um, expectations is legitimate without any further means to distinguish, uh, to distinguish based on justice consideration or on what I have called the stringency um, criteria that I presented earlier and so on. Um, but again, this is something that we might take up in the debate, but it's, I think, of lesser general interest here. Okay, with that, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. And yeah, 